Friends, welcome to Peace Online. My name is Winston Pratt and I am one of the pastors here on Staff at Peace. And we are so glad that you've joined us for worship today and pray that you will be blessed in your hearts and in your spirit by our time of worship. So here's a thought. Every generation has a book or an idea that grips the public's imagination and also gives us a deeper insight into ourselves. I'm thinking of in the realm of fiction, the Harry Potter series that just flew off the bookshelves a few years back. It transported millions of people to a world where good triumphed over evil as Harry embraced his calling as the Chosen One. But also in the realm of self-help, I think of Daniel Goldman's landmark book called Emotional Intelligence. I'm sure you have heard of it, and I'm sure many of you have read it. I have done so too. That catchphrase, emotional intelligence, is now commonplace in public discourse. Goldman's book really helped us to see that success was due more to emotional intelligence than to IQ or brain smarts. How well you were able to read others and how well you were able to read yourself was a stronger determinant of success than being top of the class academically. So friends, we discover that the same is true spiritually. How well we know ourselves will determine the progress that we make in faith and how we mature as believers over time. So the question that I want us to consider for today is this. How well do you know your own heart? How strong is your faith really? Or if I was to play off Goldman's phrase, I could state it like this. What's your level of spiritual intelligence? So our sermon series over this summer has been called When Heroes Fall, and I've chosen that title for two reasons. First, because the Bible presents us with this cast of flawed and problematic characters, but in them we see that the heroes of faith are able to do great things for God on some occasions, but also mess up terribly on others. And because of that, we feel this strange sense of connection with them. Their lives seem to mirror our lives in a way. But second, it is also there because I want it to give us hope. It reminds us that God doesn't just cast us off because we fail. Instead, we see that God molds us into the people that He wants us to be as our hearts remain open to Him despite our blunders and our flaws. Nonetheless, we see that many of the Bible heroes still do fall. And there's a saying that goes, Never meet your heroes, lest you discover that they have feet of clay. And that's very, very true. You may discover on meeting them that they are just as human as the rest of us. So, let me share with you a story. This was told to me by a former colleague of mine. Her husband owned his own transport business and they provided shuttle services from the airports to the hotels. He was so excited one day to discover that his company, their firm, had been approached to pick up a very, very famous Hollywood star. Now, this was no ordinary star. This was his idol. She was his ideal woman, this combination of beauty and of brains and of charisma. And did I say beauty? And he watched all of her films. So he put on his best suit, splashed on his most expensive cologne, cleaned the car on the inside and polished it on the outside. And he decided that he was going to handle this assignment himself. He wasn't going to give it to his staff. Now, I'm sure you know how this story is going to end, but let me continue. He came home that day totally dejected. He just walked into the house, his wife tells me, and went to go sit down at the kitchen table looking all glum. After a while, she finally got him to open up. And he told her that his idol was blind drunk, falling all over her feet. She ignored him totally and treated him as though he didn't exist. He was just the chauffeur. All the way from the airport to the hotel, she was on her cell phone complaining and swearing left, right, and center. His hero, he discovered, was a foul-mouthed, entitled prima donna. His perfect image of her was totally shattered. But here's a thought, one that I want us to consider today. 
What if the hero or idol is you yourself? By that I mean, what if you or I, what if we are the ones with the inflated ego? What if you are the one seeing yourself more highly than you ought? Friends, that pretty much summed up the Apostle Peter. He was a hero in his own mind. Now, as one of the Bible characters, I love Peter. He's one of my favorite Bible characters. He can be a star one moment and a disaster the next moment and then bounce back with a gusto again. And let's be fair to Peter. He actually has a lot going for himself. I think that often we give him a really bad rap. He was a take charge kind of guy. He was clearly a natural re leader who commanded respect from others. And we see that he's often telling others what to do and they follow. And also, Jesus chose him to be one of the disciples and gave him the name Peter, which is Greek for rock or rocky. So, we discover a little bit later as well that he is also part of an inner circle of three together with James and John. So, he's part of the twelve, but he's also part of an even closer inner circle of three. And we see that whenever his name gets mentioned, including the list of the other disciples, his name appears first, really giving us a sense and indicating that he is the general leader of the group. And all of this we see gave him a sense of confidence and importance that bolstered his faith. And there was the problem, there is the rub. That's where the real issue lay. Peter must took his natural gifts, as well as his special call, as a sign of his inner spiritual strength and faith. And friends, I'll be honest, we still make that very same mistake today. We look at people in high positions in the church and just assume they are there because of their strong faith. But not necessarily so. We can't just assume that that is true. Or we ourselves may be in such a high position in the church and assume that God has chosen us because of our deep faith and our keen spiritual insight. And again I say, not necessarily so. Peter had natural gifting and he had a special calling, but he still lacked the inner emotional intelligence needed to know his own heart. And so what was the remedy? Well, Peter needed to be brought in touch with the real Peter, to see himself for who he really was, and that was not a pleasant experience. And so, friends, we come to today's passage. It's the passage where Jesus tells Peter that he will deny him three times before the cock or the rooster crows. So here is the story. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Friends, what a disturbing line. Whenever I hear it, I still shudder and it makes me feel awkward. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Satan wants to have a go at him, and Jesus, we discover, will allow it so that it becomes a life lesson for Peter. So what's the backdrop to today's story? Well, we discover that this actually is the Lord's Supper. Jesus has just poured out his heart to them and told them that he's about to be betrayed and killed. And they, like good friends, have listened intently and offered words of encouragement and support. No, that's not so. We know that's not how the story plays out. What are they doing? They are actually arguing over who among them is the greatest. And in Jesus' hour of greatest need, they are more concerned about their own stature and greatness. So, what does Jesus do? Jesus actually allows them to be tested. Yes, friends, you've heard me say this before, and I will say it again, and I'll say it over and over and over again. God allows our faith to be tested. If anybody wants to introduce you to Christianity and gives you the impression that once you come to Jesus, everything will always be plain sailing, and you will not encounter any kind of tests and any kinds of trials, that is not true. 
God allows our faith to be tested. He allows it to be tested so that He can reveal what must be broken down and removed. But ultimately, always, God allows it to be tested so that He can build us up and strengthen what is there that is genuine. So I'll be honest, that experience of testing, it can really be a bruising one, especially when we are confronted with who we are. And friends, in this story, Peter is about to get in touch with Peter. So that reminds me of another story. A former CEO that I worked with was a really, truly gifted businessman, a natural leader, and also a pretty competitive sports person. He was the kind of person that you knew could lead a Fortune 500 company. He came to work all downcast one day. And our leadership meetings were normally interesting and engaging and quite energetic. Not this one. It was totally flat. He was totally flat. So eventually we also asked him what was up, and I've never forgotten his answer. He said, my teenage son and I, we often go cycling in the morning before work and school, and we race each other towards the end, and I normally let him win on occasion just to keep him motivated. Today's race was especially tight, except this time he beat me on his own. The reality of his Waning physical prowess hit him hard. What was the issue with Peter? We discovered that the issue with Peter is poor emotional and spiritual intelligence. This came out when Jesus spoke to him as overconfidence and empty boasting. But reality, friends, was about to hit Peter very, very hard. And so how do things play out? Well, they play out just as Jesus predicted. Jesus is arrested and forced to appear before the high priest. Peter kept a low profile, standing at a distance and watching from afar. And three times there in the home of the high priest, people looked at him and said, You are one of them. And three times he replies, No, I don't know him at all. And on the third occasion, as he said that, guess what happened? The rooster crowed. And we are told that Jesus turned around and looked directly at him from across the courtyard. And that blazing look from Jesus directly into Peter's eyes cut straight through his eyes into his heart. In that moment, Jesus had introduced Peter to Peter. And what happened? We are told that he just turned and ran out and wept inconsolably. Friends, the gospel often begins by introducing us to ourselves first. And as we see, that's often not a pretty picture or a pleasant experience. It exposes what is in our hearts and it reveals who we really are. How many people have said, and this may be true of you, I never thought that I would cheat on an exam. Or, I never thought that I would lie to my partner. I never thought I would steal from a close friend. I never ever thought that I would say something so cruel to someone that I loved. I never thought that I would run someone down just so that I could get ahead. I never thought I could do this or I never thought I would do that. How many have said those things, but I did. Friends, Peter never thought that he would deny Jesus or flee when the pressure was on. He was confident that he wouldn't, that he would stand by Jesus, that he would help to defend Jesus. But he didn't. He did deny Jesus and he did flee. Friends, the point is this. We need the introduction so God can use us for greater things. We think we are ready. We tend to have this uh, impression of ourselves. But God knows that we are not. So that saying, no pain, no gain, we discover, is necessary for spiritual formation too. We need it, otherwise we develop this inflated view of ourselves and our faith cannot grow. And we also end up becoming blunt instruments for God. But God wants our faith to grow and God wants to make sure that we are sharp and we are focused and He can use us. But here is why it is called gospel good news 
Because even though we go through that particular experience, God never leaves us there and He never leaves us alone. Hear Jesus' words again. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers and sisters. Note two important things there. Firstly, Jesus is actually watching over Peter in the trial. Jesus is praying that the core of his faith will remain intact. You see, Jesus knows that there is real faith there, but Jesus also knows that that real faith, that kernel of real faith, has been covered over by layers of pride and of self-confidence, by layers of arrogance and conceit. And Jesus knows that those layers must be removed for Peter to become the leader that Jesus wants him to be. And in his case, only a painful life lesson will do the job. But still, even though he's going to go through this extremely painful experience, Jesus is still there holding on to and protecting the core of his faith. But secondly, I also want us to see that Jesus knows the end result. Jesus knows that he will actually eventually pull through. However, not by his own strength this time, but by God's power at work in him. And when he does, he will be in a better position to lead God's people. So what does Jesus do? Jesus actually allows him to be sifted as wheat. But because Jesus is watching over him, friends, we discover that Peter's failure will actually become a pathway to success in God's hands because Jesus is the one watching over him and protecting him and helping him through. My brothers and sisters and my friends, what a wonderful message of hope this story is. To know that with God our greatest failure can actually become a catalyst for success. We see in the story that Satan sought to destroy Peter's faith and to knock him down and to keep him there. But we see that God sought to knock off the bad bits and to give him a powerful reality check. But ultimately God wanted to build him up so that he could come out stronger. So where do we leave off? Where did we leave off? Well, we left off, if you remember, with Peter running away, a humbled and broken man. His image of himself as a bastion of faith is now shattered and in pieces. And he returns home to Galilee and takes up his old profession again. He's waiting for Jesus because Jesus had sent the disciples there. But we see that he takes up his old profession again. And we probably meant to read that he very possibly felt that he was no longer worthy of the special call that Jesus had placed on his life. And they went out that day or that evening and they caught nothing. And suddenly they hear a voice from the shore telling them to cast their net on the other side. And they do and they bring in this massive haul and they look and they see, oh, it's Jesus on the shore waiting for them. And we see in the story that Jesus is actually there making them this breakfast. And Peter jumps out of the boat and he heads off to Jesus. And after the meal, Jesus takes him aside and the two of them go for a walk. But you can sense that there's still tension in the air. Things are not quite cleared between Jesus and Peter. And Peter doesn't quite know how the story is going to play out. And as they are walking, three times Jesus asks him, Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter answers Jesus, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. But friends, in the story, the English translation doesn't really convey very well what's going on in the Greek. The first two times, Jesus uses the Greek word for love, agapao. That word really defines or means a self-denying love that conveys the sense of total commitment and dedication. But Peter replied with the word for love, phileo. And that word signified strong love between friends, but it wasn't quite as high as agapao. The third time Jesus, when he asks him, do you love me, actually uses Peter's own word, phileo. We discover that phileo is still all that Peter can manage at this time. He can't reach as high as agapao. All he can manage is phileo. But friends, I don't want you to see this as a lack of devotion. I think rather... It shows that 
Peter has been humbled by the sifting. Now he cannot bring himself to make these bold and boastful claims of faith again. Peter is a humble man who has learnt a big lesson. An important lesson that he has learnt is that the life of faith is not lived in the power of our own strength and of our own abilities. Faith is always fueled by the power of God in us. Friends, I'll say that again. Faith is always fueled by the power of God in us. And three times as they are walking, Jesus tells Peter, feed my sheep. And in saying that three times, we discover that this is actually a double blessing that the Lord is giving to Peter. First, it is a fresh commissioning for service in God's kingdom. Jesus is reappointing him as a leader of God's people to care for them, to nurture them, and to build them up. But we also can see that it is a sign assuring Peter that he has been totally forgiven. And friends, I think even more than the commissioning, those are the words, or that is the sign that Peter needed to get from Jesus. And here in Jesus recommissioning him, he gets at this beautiful sign of assurance that he has been forgiven and that God will still use him in God's purposes. Imagine that. Forgiveness and reinstatement after denying and deserting the Lord. But that, my friends, is grace. It's the very definition of grace. And God extends that same offer to you and me today when we turn to Him. We discover that the power of forgiveness has transformed Peter. Later, after Jesus' ascension, on the day of Pentecost, we see a different Peter. We see Peter boldly proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus has risen and is alive, and that everyone should repent and turn to him as the world's true Savior. We also see that to, P to Peter forever belongs the amazing privilege of being the human agent that Jesus chose to set the birth of the church in motion. God's new worldwide family of faith as we know it Peter is the one that God used to set that in motion. He is the first leader of the early church. But friends, we also see that Peter was prepared to go to jail for Jesus and refuses to be silenced in proclaiming the gospel despite hostile opposition and violent threats. What we see is not a Peter who is running away this time. Instead, we see a brave and a confident new Peter demonstrating agapao love, not just phileo love, for Jesus, his Lord and his Savior. We discover that here, Peter is actually rising to the great call that Jesus had placed on his life. This time, not in his own strength and not in his own confidence, but in the power and the strength of God within him by the Holy Spirit. It's a new Peter. It's a different Peter. It's still a very confident Peter, but now in God's strength. So brothers and sisters, friends, there is one more crucial lesson that I believe that we need to hear from today's story. And the lesson is this, that with God, conviction of sin may shatter our self-image, but it never leaves us down in the dumps. It never leaves us there. Instead, we see that spirit-produced conviction always leads to repentance and to restoration. Those two go hand in hand when the spirit is convicting us. Now, conviction of sins is not a bad thing. We, like Peter, may be feeling the burn of Jesus' gaze in our hearts, but I don't want you to dismiss it. It may be pointing to unconfessed sin that still resides there. That may be the Spirit beginning to draw you back to God. The world today, in fact, will let you believe that feelings of guilt and remorse are bad for you. But friends, that is not necessarily true. They are there to remind us that our sin has consequences and that we have offended God. Conviction of sin and those feelings of guilt and remorse aren't necessarily bad. I see them very much as, the, as similar to the body's pain reflex. Pain is awful and we want pain to go away, but pain actually 
tells us that something is wrong that must be fixed. And if we didn't have any pain, didn't feel it from time to time, we run the risk of hurting ourselves even more without knowing it. Friends, it's the same with spirit-produced conviction. But remember this, spirit-produced conviction in our hearts always leads to repentance and restoration. So if you have truly repented and still feel bad after a long time, friends, that is not from God. That is not from God at all. That is Satan trying to get you down, to drag you down, and to keep you there. His name, Satan, actually means the accuser, and making you feel bad over and over again is his favorite and also his most effective ploy. It's one of the main reasons I believe that many Christians today feel defeated, but also live lives of spiritual depression. But friends, don't let Satan dupe you. Don't let Satan dupe you. Hear me out, my brothers and sisters. That accusation has no power at all. As the Apostle John says in his first letter, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So friends, if that is how you feel, constantly filled with this sense of guilt and regret and never really being able to move forward in your faith because you feel as though you are dragging this along with you every step of the way, I'm giving you permission through the story from God to say, let that go. That accusation has no power over you at all. So if that is how you feel, constantly dragged down by guilt and regret, look to Peter. And as you look to Peter, see that true conviction, as painful as it may be at first, always leads to repentance and to forgiveness and to restoration. As Paul tells us in Romans 8 verses 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And as he says again in Galatians 5 verses 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. And that glorious liberty always includes the freedom from bondage to a guilty conscience. You don't have to live with a guilty conscience. Christ has come to cleanse us from sin and to give us a clean conscience before God, to take away all that guilt, to expunge it, to cover over it, so that we can be set free. Friends, that glorious liberty that we have in Christ always includes the freedom from bondage to a guilty conscience. So, as we end, I want us to remember this. With God, there are always second chances. No one is beyond hope. But also with God, failure need not be the defining feature of your life's legacy. God can still use you and make something special of your life. Friends, let me close in prayer. Dear God, we praise you for the precious gift of grace that cleanses our guilty consciences, restores our failing hearts, and places us on a better path in life by your Spirit's power. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, all the many ways that we have failed you when our faith has been tested. And thank you, Lord, that you are with us in all of the trials of life, that you hold us, Lord, in the palm of your hand, and that you intercede before God the Father on our behalf. Oh, Lord, what a wonderful joy to know that you can bring good out of the mistakes that we have made. Lord, help us to live into the freedom your forgiveness brings and help us to hold on to the promise that there is no condemnation for those who have turned to you. May it fill us with hope and with peace and with overflowing joy so that others can see the light of your love shining in and through us. We ask all of this, Lord Jesus, in your precious and powerful name. Amen.